We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. This morning, we are in the fourth week of our series, Journal Entries, Learning from Our Greatest Fears. And as we've been saying throughout the course of this series, we believe that God wants to leverage our greatest fears to become our greatest breakthroughs if we learn to process our fears through the authority of the Word of God. And and as we're learning throughout this series, it's not our fears, it's not our failures, it's not our anxieties, not our worries. None of that should have ultimate authority over us. The ultimate authority over our life is the Word of God. And so what does it look like to take these things that sometimes overwhelm us and control us and then submit them to God's word and submit them to the voice of the Holy Spirit in in our lives. And so today we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about a fear that all of us have struggled with at some point in time. You most likely do. But before we go there, what I want to do is I want to share with you what what could be considered our theme verse for this series. We're going to read this out loud together. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 7. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Let's say it again together. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God does not want you controlled by a spirit of fear. And so if there's a spirit of fear that's gripping you, you know it's not of God. You know it's not what God wants for you. He wants us controlled by the spirit of power, the Holy Spirit, where we have power over our fears and power over our emotions, power over our anxieties, and a spirit of love, which means that we're always assuming the best in every person, in every situation. The mind isn't running off on these trails. Hey, why did she speak to me that way? Or I noticed the attitude in his voice. He must have a personal issue with me. Maybe, but maybe he just had a bad day. Or maybe he just had a fight with his wife. And so I'm choosing to assume the best. And then he says, and of a sound mind, which means we're learning to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. The mind isn't running out out of control. Next week, we're going to be diving more into what that looks like. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare in this area. So I'm telling you that because I'm telling you ahead of time, pray for me this week as we prepare for next week in in that talk. And you need to be here and you need to invite somebody here to to be with us. We're going to be talking about this idea of a sound mind. What does it look like um, to have this sound mind in the midst of our fears? So as I said, today we're going to be talking about a fear that everybody can relate to, that everybody struggled with at some point in time or another in their life. And that is what we're going to start off calling a fear of rejection. Okay, a fear of rejection. More specifically, a fear of rejection tied to needing the approval of others. I need the approval of others to be able to function in life. I can't function if I even think that someone's upset with me or they don't like me or there's a relational conflict. What does it look like to battle and fight through this fear of rejection or needing the approval of others? So why is this an issue? Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 25, listen to what Solomon says. In fact, read it with me. Ready? Here's what he says. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Let's say it again. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. So why does a fear of rejection, a fear of man needing the approval of others, why does it bring a snare? Why does it bring a trap? And here's the reason why. Because what I need in life will eventually control me. What I need in life will eventually control me. And so if I'm a person that's gripped by the spirit of fear and the spirit of rejection, what that means is I can't function in life unless I have the approval of people. And if you let your mind go down that trail for just a little bit, you begin to realize the number of relationships that are in your life. And you begin to think, how in the world do I please everybody? Do you see the issue? Some of you are there this morning. You don't have to let your mind go there because it's already there. How do I make everybody happy? How do I please everyone? It's impossible. And so if I spend my life in in the fear of people, a fear of rejection, needing others' approval, I spend my life controlled by people. And that's an issue. That's not what God's desire is for you. Now, let me just be completely honest. As your pastor... 
This is a fear. This is an issue. This is a struggle that I personally have had as long as I can remember. Because like the rest of you, I want to be liked, right? We want to be liked. We want people to like us. We want people to approve of us. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. The issue comes in when that crosses a line to not being able to live without approval. And all of us know what it's like to fall into that category where we cross this line of, I want to be liked to, I have to have people's approval. That's an issue. So I want to give you a point for this morning. I want to tell you a little bit more about my struggle with this. I want you to write this down. The fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. The fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. We're just going to get to the bottom of it. That's what this means. The fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. Now, as I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting a good reputation. I mean, we should want that. We should desire that. I believe that brings great glory and honor to God. The issue is, again, in our need for approval, it crosses the line. It goes in the hyperdrive where we cannot function without that. We cannot function without that. And in fact, we live in a world, as I've said, this hits very close to home for all of us because if you're connected to social media in any way, shape, or form, whether a Twitter account or a Facebook account or whatever, we live in a world where social media has just completely exasperated this desire of us to need and want the approval of others. Now, this isn't a message against social media, but let me just say say what it is in, in relation to this for just a moment. This is a recent book released by Craig Rochelle, well-known pastor, and, and it's called Hashtag Struggles. And in it, he talks about the influence of social media. Not a bad thing in any way, shape, or form, but it can become an issue. Such as when we post something to social media, look at what he said, listen to what he says. We often get immediate feedback when we post something, a picture, you know, the kids of ourself, you know, the selfie in the mirror, whatever. Uh, we get immediate feedback. But the problem with this kind of immediate feedback, it's a quick affirmation. It's that it's addicting. Even when we know it's shallow, when the person who likes our photo isn't really sincere, or they say something that, you know, is just a quick comment in passing, we still love receiving it. Now, to be fair, it's not our fault. Scientists say that receiving positive affirmation like this releases dopamine, which is a chemical in our brains that gives us this kind of euphoric feeling, a little rush. Just like similar drugs, we can easily get addicted to that high. If you don't believe you're addicted, you post a photo. How many times do you go back to see who's liked it and how many likes you have? It's kind of funny because we know it's true, but it's kind of not because we may have an issue, right? If you don't believe me, consider the last time you posted a selfie and you didn't get much of a response, at least in the first hour. Do you remember having empty feelings and thoughts like these running through your mind? See if you can identify with these. Where is everyone? What's up with that? How many have clicked on my post? Did they like it? Who liked it? Why didn't she like it? She never likes my pictures. I'm going to stop liking hers. Just keep that up, sister, and you're going to get yourself unfollowed. Many of us are addicted to immediate affirmation. What is this addiction doing to us? How is it affecting relationships? Sociologists call this deferred loneliness. We're trying to meet some short-term need, but in the process of meeting this need, we're deferring a deeper, longer-term need. In other words, this approval that we're craving and that we're after that should be filled by God and his approval in our life, where do we turn to meet that approval need? We're turning to social media more than ever. Which is why when we don't get as many likes on our picture as she did on hers or as he did on his, we feel lonely, we feel depressed, we feel rejected. It's this overall fear of rejection. There's another book I've been reading recently when people are big and God is small that he asked Edward T. Welch, the author, he asked a series of questions that kind of give us an indicator of could we be controlled by this fear of rejection or needing other people's approval. And so we asked these series of questions. For example, have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Like even think back to your days as a middle schooler, high schooler. Have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Most of us have, right? Here's the issue, is that a lot of us never got free from that struggle, and so what have we done? We've carried it now into adulthood, 
And it's changed from peer pressure to people pleasing. Are you a person that's overcommitted? Do you overcommit yourself? Well, what's the reason behind that? Again, is it behind it? Is it a need to be a pleaser of people? Do you, well, this, is, this is a good question. Do you need, really need something from your spouse? Like, it's not a matter of like good communication and mutual honor between spouses. That's not what he's saying. But what he's asking is, is are you a person that you're allowing your spouse to quietly take the place of God in your life? It's a good question. Is self-esteem a critical and ongoing concern for you? Do you need others to buttress your sense of well-being and identity? You need them or you're looking to them to fill you up. Are you a person that's afraid of being exposed as an imposter, meaning that a sense of, a sense of being is exposed as an expression of, of the fear of man? You have this fear of man that's underlying this need. Are you always second-guessing decisions because of what other people may think? Are you afraid of looking bad in other people's eyes? Are you someone that looks to others to fill you? Meaning, are you feeling empty or meaningless? Do you experience love hunger? Are you a person that gets easily embarrassed because of the opinions of others to the point that you're ruled by those? Do you ever lie little white lies just to make yourself look better? Are you jealous of other people? Are you controlled by them and their possessions? Do people make you angry, depressed? Do you lose your mind when it comes to people? You say, that's easy to do, right? But it's an indicator that they could be the controlling center of your life, that you have a fear of man that's gripping you. When you compare yourself with other people, do you feel good about yourself? Perhaps the most dangerous form of the fear of man is successful fear of man. Such people think they've made it, that they have more than other people. They feel good about themselves, but their lives are still but fine by other people rather than God. The fear of rejection, needing the approval of man, means that people rather than God are controlling my life. Now, what's been interesting in my own personal struggles, the moment of transparency here, is I look at what I've done in my adulthood, the two professions that I've been a part of, and, and how both of them, God has positioned me in my, one of my biggest fears to have to wrestle through this issue. For example, out of college, the very first thing I did was I was a teacher and a coach. And if there's one thing that I learned as a coach, it's the fact that you'll never make everybody happy. You'll never make every kid happy, and you're surely not going to make every parent happy. It's just impossible. It's literally impossible. If you're smiling, um, it's because you're a coach and you want to say amen, like you've coached your little league team, your son's little league team, you want to say amen, preacher. If that rubs you a little bit, it's because you're that parent that can't be made happy, all right? But it's just the fact of the matter. You're never going to make everybody happy. And so I remember even struggling with this as a, teach, as a teacher and a coach. Now, let me tell you, the one thing, you're still not going to make everybody happy, but silence all critics is winning, right? You get the win or you consistently win and people still may not like it, but what are they going to say about it? You're, you're winning. It's interesting though that now that I'm a pastor and been called into a pastorate, how I find myself still in the middle of the same battle. If you're in any form of leadership, you've got your own company or you're leading maybe in a school system or maybe you're leading in your job in a, in a, in a company, in the workplace, whatever it may be, you know the struggle. You're never going to make everybody happy. And let me tell you why that's so hard as a pastor. It's because I will tell you, my wife and I, we really do love people. I mean, we absolutely love you. We love people. From the bottom of our hearts, we just love people. We enjoy people. We do. We love people. We're both extroverts, very, very outgoing. But I will be honest with you. There are times where I know the Holy Spirit has convicted us because people loving crosses the line to become people pleasing. And there's a very fine line in there. Are you with me? We're very quiet in here this morning, I think, because it's probably resonating with a lot of us. God has never called us to please people. He's been, we've been called to please him. But I will be honest with you, it is an ongoing struggle because like the rest of you, I don't want anybody mad at me. In fact, some of you are probably mad at me this morning. I don't even know about it, okay? Doesn't mean you should email and tell me about it. It's not what I'm asking you to do. But I've just learned in leadership, it's impossible. You're never gonna make everybody happy. 
And if I let myself cross that line and go down this path, think about it. Hundreds and hundreds of sets of expectations of a pastor. And this is where the pastor should do and this, that, the other. This is what it should dress like. This is what it should look like. I mean, if I let myself go down that path as a pastor, like hundreds of sets of expectations, like who should I, should I meet yours? Should I meet yours? I mean, what do you do with that? And, and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's the temptation to cross this line from people loving to people pleasing. And there's a line in there, very fine line in there. A few years ago, I made a statement, even on a platform, where I had said, just feeling just the, I mean, pressures that all of you feel if you're in leadership. But I remember making this statement. I said, I wish there were 800 of me to go around. Like that I could just walk with all of you. I mean, because we love people. And that sounded very good and very loving and very pastorly at the time until I couldn't get that thought out of my mind. And I couldn't get it out of my mind and I wrestled that whole week with it until eventually it hit me, the Holy Spirit convicting me. 800 of you to go around, do you know what that would be? Idolatry. It'd be idolatry. And so I have to ask the question as a pastor, what's the win? What's the win? The win is really simple. It's hearing the voice of God and doing what he says. And you know what the win is for you, if I can, and for me as I lead you, is to teach you how to do that as well. Because what that means is as your pastor, I'm not taking the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm helping you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and do what he says, just as he calls me to do what, what he says for me as well. Are you with me? Like, this is the win. This is the win. And so with this in mind, what we're going to do is look at an Old Testament story this morning where we see where God takes his voice, his word, his speaking to us very, very seriously. And this is why, as we're going to see in just a moment, above all else, I want you above everything to learn to hear the voice of God in your life and the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and to have the courage to do what he says to do. We're going to see why this is so important and why this should be the win for you as well. So look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Saul has been anointed as king over Israel, the very first king over Israel. And as we're going to see in a little bit, God regrets that he made Saul king. And we're going to find out why in just a moment. But in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel comes to Saul and he reminds Saul that he has been anointed king for a purpose. Then Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of, of the Lord. So Saul, you have been called for a very specific purpose. I've positioned you here in this season for a very specific reason. And my calling, my voice to you, what I'm speaking to you, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than your comfort. It's bigger than your complacency. It's bigger than the people that you're leading. You have to hear my voice, Saul. Verse number two. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. That's important. Utterly destroy all that he has, all that the Amalekites have. And do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Utterly destroy all that he has. So the question is this. So was there this recent issue that had, been, had risen with Amalek and the Amalekites? And the answer is no. In fact, this issue that's being referred to here is something that stems back 400 years prior when Israel was being led out of Egyptian bondage. And you can imagine how stressful this uh, this, this exodus was. I mean, people were tired, they were weary, they grew sick, they grew weak, they had injuries. And the, the issue was here is that Amalek and the Amalekites, they saw the weak, they were traveling as part of Israel's party, and they used it as an opportunity to attack them. And so they attacked the weak. And, and just to jog your memory, maybe if you're not familiar with this story, you are familiar with um, this battle where Joshua leads Israel into battle and Moses goes up on the mountain and he takes with him Aaron and her. And remember when Moses' arms are down by his side, they grew tired, they're down by his side, Israel loses, right? They raise his arms up, they hold his arms up and they, they begin to win. So now what's happening is this. 
few, not, not long after that battle, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, here's what the Lord says. Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? How he met you along the way and attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies and the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. Say those words with me. You must not forget. So here's what you need to understand from this story. God takes his word and his glory very, very seriously. It's true of the written word of scripture and it's true of the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. God takes his voice, his word, his speaking very, very seriously. We never should take the voice of God, the word of God for granted. Never. God takes it seriously. So much so, That 400 years later, Saul becomes king and God says to Saul, Saul, now's the time to fulfill what I said would happen hundreds of years ago. Now's the time. You're gonna utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now's the time. Saul, you have been anointed for this purpose, to fulfill the word that I spoke hundreds of years ago. Okay, you with me? So Saul leads Israel into battle and they win the battle and they destroy Israel everything for the most part. We've got a problem. In fact, if you look with me at verse number nine in 1 Samuel 15, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. Do you see the issue? God says destroy them utterly, but Saul and the people weren't willing to do it. But they did, they did destroy everything despised and worthless that they, were, that, they, uh, that they utterly destroyed. So here's what happens. Partial obedience, which equals disobedience. And we live in a society and a culture where it's increasingly popular to take the parts of the word of God that are convenient, that we want, that we like, that match our lifestyles, Embrace those, but to reject that which is not so convenient or not so comfortable. Are you with me? God takes his word and his glory very, very seriously. And this becomes a huge issue for Saul because in this case, Saul is living in the moment. We've won the battle. We've won the victory. This is awesome, but God is not pleased. And so what does he do? He sends Samuel to confront Saul. And in sending him to confront Saul, Saul sees him coming. Hey, Samuel, we won the battle. Samuel's not impressed. Verse number 17. Samuel said, is it not true? Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? But you rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But Saul tries to justify it. But God, we we save the best. We save the best of the spoils. And and, and he tells Samuel, we're rationalizing this in his mind. He tells Samuel, but but we're going to offer these up as a sacrifice to the Lord, all the best of the livestock. We're going to give it to God. And, and, And this is where Samuel says in verse number 22, but that's not the point. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I didn't call you to save the best and then to offer it as a sacrifice. I called you to utterly destroy. My word was spoken forth to utterly destroy. But you took what you wanted out of it. You partially obeyed, which means you disobeyed. God takes his word very, very seriously. And as a result of this, God regrets that he made Saul king. In fact, he rejects Saul as king. In chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, this is where we see God sending Samuel to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king, King David. God takes his word very, very seriously. 
And so what we're about to see is we're gonna get down to the root of it all. What's the real issue here? What's the real issue in Saul's heart? Verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. So he confesses, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words. Now look at what he says. Because I feared the people and I listened to their voice. Because I feared the people and I listened to their voice. I believe that what we will constantly find ourselves in in the middle of the war that we're in is this constant tension between the voice of people and the voice of God, the word of people, the word of God. And at the end of the day, we just got to decide who is it that we're going to please? Like, what's the win? What's the win? And if my life is going to be about the approval of people, then understand that that's not the win. If my life is about the approval of God and I can settle that in my heart once and for all, then I learn to hear the voice of God and do what he says, regardless of the tide of culture, regardless of the winds of culture, regardless of the winds of those, you know, in in my life, my friends, others. Because at the end of the day, the win is that I please God. But see, this fear of rejection, it's a good indicator if we're gripped by this fear that we could be replacing God with people and the approval of God with the need to have the approval of people. Let's state our point together again. The fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. Say it with me. The fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. Saul had replaced God with the people. God grew smaller and smaller and the voice of people grew larger and larger in his life. We have to be very careful what we're listening to. Listen to what Edward T. Walt says. <clears throat> what is the result of this people idolatry? As in all idolatry, the idol we choose to worship, it soon owns us. The object we fear, it overcomes us. Although insignificant in itself, the idol becomes huge and rules us. It tells us how to think and what to feel and how to act. It tells us what to wear. It tells us to laugh at the dirty joke. It tells us to be frightened to death that we might have to get up in front of a group and say something. The whole strategy backfires. We never expect that using people to meet our desires leaves us enslaved to them because what we need will eventually control us. So personally, what does it look like for me to fight this battle? When I was coaching, Again, it came down to the win. What's the win? And fortunately in coaching is you have a scoreboard at the end of the game that's kept track, right? And so at the end of the game, the win is, is you have more runs or you have more points than the other team. Like that's easy. That's easy to keep track that way. But in a world where there are an infinite number of voices that are trying to speak into the mind, what's the win for us? When you, like myself, I mean, you have a lot of expectations projected onto you. Like, what's the win? I mean, who who am I going to make happy? Like, how how do you decide that? Like, what's the win? And you face that as well. You know, you're not a pastor maybe, but you face that as well. What's the win? So I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit is, is asking. What's the win? Gabe, what's the win for you? What's the win? You know what he's told me? The win is number one, that you love me, that you love God. That you give me your first and your best time each and every morning and you grow in your intimacy with me and you live out of the overflow of that intimacy. You grow so close to me that you hear my voice on a moment by moment basis and you live in this exciting journey where I'm speaking and you're obeying and you find yourself wrapped up in this divine flow. That's the win. That's what God's told me. That's the win, Gabe. That's the win for you, that I love God. And then secondly, the win for me is that I love people. God says you need to love people. Jesus said, was asked, what's the great commandment? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the second is like it. The same as means you love your neighbor as yourself and so that you love people. Now, let me tell you where this begins for me. The win is, is that it begins in my home. 
with my wife. You know, I don't know what kind of maybe expectations you have for a pastor. Maybe you've got a you know, certain expectation or what have you. But I want you to know as your pastor that the win for me, the win for me, what God has told me the win is, is that I love him. And then secondly, that I love my wife. And that I love my wife as I would love myself, as scripture says. Because how in the world would I lead a group of people if I can't lead myself in my home well? Are you with me? So that's the win, that I love my wife. Just this past week, I was watching um, ESPN, and, and they, um, they have a segment every so often called ESPN's 30 for 30. And this past week, they had a new segment on uh, Bill McCartney. Did anybody happen to watch that, ESPN's 30 for 30 on Bill McCartney? Okay. So there's one person between both services. This is good. Um, but let me, let me tell you what was really cool. Bill McCartney, for those that don't know, he was a, uh, the head coach of the University of Colorado, the football program back in the 90s. And he's the one responsible for bringing the program really back to the, a national prominence. They won a national championship under him. You may not know him as that. You may know him as the one who started Promise Keepers. Some of you remember that now. He's the one that started Promise Keepers. And so anyways, in this segment, he was telling the story of he had just had a huge, huge win on Saturday, college football on Saturday. And they had just either beat Oklahoma or Nebraska, you know, one of the big powerhouses back in the 90s. And so he had a big win on Saturday, which of course he said makes it easier to go to church on Sunday. And so he's sitting in church on Sunday and there was a pastor who, who was I don't know, 30 years in the ministry, the speaking that morning. And he was saying, this is the most important thing for us as men. The most important thing, 30 years of pastoring, and this is really what it all comes down to. He said, men, here's the win for you. That you can look at your wife and you can see splendor on her face. And Bill McCartney looks over at his wife after the pastor says that, and he said, I looked at my wife and it wasn't there. And he said, from that moment forward, I had to redefine the win. The win wasn't what happened on a Saturday afternoon. The win was seeing the splendor and joy on the face of my wife. Man, I would encourage you to look at your wife and look at her face. And if there's no joy or splendor there, then you need to reorder some things. You need to redefine the win. Because let me tell you, it's, it's about much more than just making your wife happy. Do you understand? Scripture says and teaches us that in our marriage, the gospel's on display before the world. So how can I neglect my wife, neglect my marriage, and then tell the world how much Jesus loves them? Are you with me? We need to redefine the win. You know what it also means for me, what the Holy Spirit told me? Gabe, it also means you love your little girls. The Holy Spirit told me, Gabe, your girls, they have one daddy and you've got one shot at this thing and you gotta get it right. You have been blessed and honored with the privilege of being a dad to three little girls. And let me tell you, in the culture that we live in, this scares me to death. So my little girls, they need to know that their daddy loves them, that he approves them, and that he's going to get this, this fathering thing right for them. He's going to get it right. I shared this a few weeks ago, but I was at a conference in April, the group of pastors, and one of the pastors said this to the pastors. He said, fellas, if we finish without our families, we lose. I want you to know as your pastor, I'm not going to finish without my family. The win is, as a pastor and loving people, that I love you. And you know what that primarily begins with? It begins with me giving myself to prayer and to the ministry of the word, Acts chapter 6. That's one of the primary ways that I pour my love out on you, is I want to feed you well each and every week when you come to need to hear from God. I want you to know we pray for you fervently as your pastor, his wife. The win is, is that I love people who are far from God because I want to see people saved. I want to see people who are in darkness. I want to see them come into light of and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the win. And you know, when you love God, you love people. And it all happens in that order. There's really a love for life there where you live in this divine flow. 
You live out of the overflow of your intimacy with God and you're excited about what God has in store in life and God, how are you gonna move today and how can I get in on it? God, are you speaking in this, in this relationship or in this conversation? And Lord, is, is this, can I, is, are you leading me to share the gospel? I mean, you know, it's just this exciting life that God has called us to be a part of. Now, I wanna tell you this, at the end of the day, it, what sums it all up, the win is that we hear the voice of God and we do what he says. And so I would encourage you, some of you are in bondage to a fear of rejection this morning. And you need to redefine the win in your life, which is learning to hear the voice of God. Allowing the word of God to have the authority over your life rather than your fears or your need for approval or your fear of rejection or whatever you want to term it or call it. I have to believe this morning there's some of you here, maybe you've been coming for a while, you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you know that you have to make that decision. You know without question, but you're worried about what people think. You're worried, what are my friends gonna think, my coworkers, what's my, what's my family gonna say? You're living in the sphere of rejection, and that's holding you back from placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. On that day, Hebrews 9, 27, appointed a man once to die and after this, the judgment. On that day, when you are before the judgment of God, it will not matter what any human being thought about you making a decision for Jesus. All that will matter in that moment is God, did I please you? That's all that's gonna matter. And so today you need to make that decision. There are some of you here this morning, you've been putting off baptism and you know you need to take that step of obedience. But you're, what are people going to think? What are they going to say? Who cares? What difference does it make? If you're pleasing to God, you need to redefine the win. Clarify the win. There's some of you here this morning, you've grown warm in your walk. You've allowed people to speak into your heart other than God. And you have allowed it to dull your passion and your heart for God. And it's killing you. I mean, it's killing you spiritually. And you've fallen into compromise and you've fallen into sin and it's all wrapped up in this, it's the same as Saul, but God, I feared their voice and I, I, I listened to them. Listen, it's time that you redefine the win, that you clarify the win. And the win is not vo listening to your friends. It's not doing what those around you say. The win is, is hearing the voice of God and doing what he says. It's time to repent. Some of you, God's been calling you to share your faith for some time in a certain relationship, maybe with family. Hey, Thanksgiving, Christmas, right around the corner. And you know, you know God is calling you to share the gospel, what he's done in your life. But God, I just, I'm afraid they're gonna think I'm crazy. I'm afraid of what they're gonna say. Fear of rejection means that people rather than God control my life. You know, this could land in any number of places this morning, but I do believe there's a lot of us need to get free today. And what you need to do is you need to turn your eyes back on Jesus. You need to turn your heart back to exalting him, making him big in your life and let everything else find its proper perspective. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time you've given us in your word, for the power of your word, Lord. God, you've spoken. God, give us ears to hear and courage to obey. Jesus' name. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Everybody's very still and quiet. If you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, today you need to make that decision. You need to place your trust in Him. I want to invite you to pray with me right now. You're not worried about what others are thinking right now. God, what does, what does God want? God wants you to be saved, to turn to Him through Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin and help me to live for you from this day forward for your approval. In Jesus' name.